Welcome back, everybody. Over the weekend, Warren Buffett published his annual letter to Berkshire Hathaway shareholders. And like every year, it's an amazing read for anyone that's interested in investing or understanding markets. But with his good friend and longtime business partner, Charlie Munger, passing away last November, this letter was likely going to be a little bit different. So in this video, we're going to go through Warren's letter to investors, talk about the four major takeaways that I took from it, and what it means going forward for Berkshire Hathaway as a stock. So let's go ahead and get started. Takeaway number one, the architect of Berkshire. Now, as you might expect, Warren spent the first page of the letter writing about his good friend, Charlie Munger. And what's great about it is that it's perfectly tailored to the target audience, which is Berkshire shareholders, because I think most people would consider Berkshire Warren's greatest crowning achievement. And when you look at the returns he's been able to gain versus the S&P 500 over the years, there's no question that it's been a huge success story. But in classic Charlie Munger fashion, he told Warren right off the bat that buying Berkshire to begin with was a mistake. And Warren talks about it like this. Nevertheless, Charlie in 1965 promptly advised me, Warren, forget about ever buying another company like Berkshire. But now that you control Berkshire, Add to it wonderful businesses purchased at fair prices and give up buying fair businesses at wonderful prices. In other words, abandon everything you learned from your hero, Ben Graham. It works, but only when practiced at small scale. With much backsliding, I subsequently followed his instructions. So a couple things about this quote. When I initially heard it, it was Warren who said it, and I didn't realize that it was actually originally from Charlie. And so much so that my actual spreadsheet workbook that I use has it in there as a reminder, but I have it attributed to Warren, so I'll need to change that. But it's this idea that trying to find okay companies at great prices is an inferior plan at a large scale than finding great companies at okay prices. Now, obviously, it gets a little deeper than that, and everyone's going to have a slightly different perspective on what exactly it means, but that's overall the gist. And that's really part of the reason why I've still been buying big tech companies in 2023, even though everyone's saying that they're overvalued. And this is where the idea that great investors always need to be contrarian really kind of hurts retail investors because sometimes the winners are just the winners and we shouldn't try to get too cute with it. But going back to the letter, Warren goes on to explain that Charlie was really the architect of the Berkshire that we know today and that Warren really played more of a general contractor role who executed Charlie's vision on a day-to-day -day basis. Part of this, I think, is just Warren being Warren. He's being very humble. He doesn't want to make it about himself, but then also wanting to showcase and highlight his dear friend and all that he meant to the company. And you can tell that Warren deeply admired his friend with how he wrote this part. Charlie never sought to take credit for his role as creator, but instead let me take the bows and receive the accolades. In a way, his relationship with me was part older brother and part loving father. Even when he knew he was right, he would give me the reins, and when I blundered, he never, never reminded me of my mistake. And it's pretty crazy to read that paragraph because it reads almost like a young man talking about his father who he respects. And I think it just shows how much Warren really looked up to Charlie. So pretty amazing stuff. And I'm sure having to write something like this was probably pretty tough, but it was a beautiful, lasting tribute to a lifelong friend. Okay, let's get into some of the other ideas of the letter. Takeaway number two, expectations for growth going forward. Now, Berkshire Hathaway is the seventh largest U.S. company at around $900 billion in market cap. And while they've had an amazing history of beating the S&P 500, it seems that Warren may be hinting in his letter that going forward, expectations should be slightly different. He starts off talking about the goal at Berkshire, which shouldn't really be a surprise. He says, our goal at Berkshire is simple. We want to own either all or a portion of businesses that enjoy good economics that are fundamental and enduring. Within capitalism, some businesses will flourish for a very long time, while others will prove to be sinkholes. It's harder than you think to predict which will be the winners and losers. And those who tell you they know the answer are usually either self-delusional or snake oil salesmen. And I love when Warren puts these little comments in his letters where he's like dropping these truth bombs, but he's doing it in the most calm, polite way possible. And he did the same thing last year, talking about people who claim share buybacks are always harmful, either to the investor or even the country. And that was one that I really loved. But then if we come back to this year, Warren goes on to say, at Berkshire, we particularly favor the rare enterprise that can deploy additional capital at high returns in the future. Owning only one of these companies and simply sitting tight can deliver wealth almost beyond measure. Even heirs to such a holding can, ugh, sometimes live a lifetime of leisure. 
And this idea that you only need a few winners is something that Warren actually talks about quite a bit, because we should never assume that all of our picks are going to be winners, but it only takes a couple big winners to make up for everything else. But turning back to Berkshire, Warren talks about why it's been getting harder. He says, This combination of the two necessities I've described for acquiring businesses has for long been our goal in purchases, and for a while, we had an abundance of candidates to evaluate. If I missed one, and I missed plenty, another always came along. But those days are long behind us. Size did us in, though increased competition for purchases was also a factor. And then just a couple paragraphs later, he mentions something that I think is the most important comment for current Berkshire shareholders to think about. There remain only a handful of companies in this country capable of truly moving the needle at Berkshire, and they have been endlessly picked over by us and by others. Some we can value and some we can't. And if we can, they have to be attractively priced. Outside the U.S., there are essentially no candidates that are meaningful options for capital deployment at Berkshire. All in all, we have no possibility of eye-popping performance. So basically, Warren is saying is that Berkshire's now at a size where there's only a handful of companies that could really move the dial for them, but that they've picked over those endlessly, and there's just not a lot of opportunity for them to continue having eye-popping performance like maybe they've had in the past. When they were smaller, they can invest in more opportunities that could still have an outsized impact on their returns. Now, he did mention that one way they can hopefully continue to outperform is taking advantage of market irrationality and prices for great companies that don't make sense from time to time. He calls that their not-so-secret weapon. He says, occasionally markets and or the economy will cause stocks and bonds of some large and fundamentally good businesses to be strikingly mispriced. And also, Berkshire's ability to immediately respond to market seizures with both huge sums and certainty of performance may offer us an occasional large-scale opportunity. So clearly, they're going to continue to try to find good opportunities, but I think it's pretty obvious that Warren's trying to set the expectation that being able to beat the market the way that they have in the past may not be as easy going forward. And he says that just a little bit more clearly here. With that focus and with our present mix of businesses, Berkshire should do a bit better than the average American corporation. And more important, should also operate with materially less risk of permanent loss of capital. Anything beyond slightly better, though, is wishful thinking. And the reason why I say he's hinting at not being able to beat the market is because the average American corporation right now isn't beating the market. The MAG7 companies are driving a lot of the market return, at least recently, and I'm assuming what he means by average is not one of those. So the questions that I think current Berkshire shareholders should be asking themselves are, what are your expectations for Berkshire as a stock? Is it to actually beat the market, or is it to get a decent return with a lower amount of overall risk than a lot of other companies out there? If it's the latter, then you're probably okay. But if it's the former, you might want to make sure your expectations fit with what Warren's view of the future is. And that's actually why I thought this part of the letter was the most interesting one by far. And even though I saw a couple people cover it, I think most people kind of skipped it and talked about other parts instead. But anyway, let's move on to the next takeaway, and it's takeaway number three. Even Warren gets it wrong sometimes. Warren talked about the scorecard for Berkshire in 2023 and specifically went back to compare his outlook for 2023 to what actually happened. And I love this because you get to see firsthand that even someone as great as Warren doesn't always get it right. And in terms of what he thought would happen, he said, one, most of their non-insurance businesses would have lower earnings in 2023. Two, the decline would be cushioned by decent results at their largest non-insurance businesses, BNSF and Berkshire Hathaway Energy, or BHE. And three, their investment income was certain to grow because of their large treasury bill position. And then lastly, four, that their insurance businesses would likely do well. Now, while Warren was pretty much correct on three of those items, he talked about how he missed on his expectations for BNSF and BHE. Now, BNSF is the largest of six major rail systems in North America, but their earnings last year declined more than Warren expected due to a couple things. One, their revenue fell, and two, their wages increased at a rate that was far beyond inflation, an issue that he says may recur in future negotiations. And just in general, their profit margins have been in decline since Berkshire purchased it. 
Now, on the BHE side, he says that most of their electric utility and gas pipeline businesses performed as expected, but that the regulatory climate in a few states has raised the possibility of zero profitability or even bankruptcy. And that's because of certain states trying to move away from the fixed but satisfactory return pack that electric utilities have used to finance their growth for more than a century. And I'm not going to get into the details of that like I understand it at all other than basically the information that Warren put in the letter. But he tries to bring home the discussion with the following paragraph. When the dust settles, America's power needs and the consequent capital expenditure will be staggering. I did not anticipate or even consider the adverse developments in regulatory returns, and along with Berkshire's two partners at BHE, I made a costly mistake in not doing so. And what I love about this part of the letter is it reinforces that idea that you can't expect every single decision or every single stock that you pick to be a winner. You won't always get everything right. You won't always anticipate every problem, and we've talked about this before, especially if you post your portfolio and analysis online like I do, people are always quick to tell you that you're wrong or that you made a bad decision. And I usually respond to this type of criticism in the same way of just saying, you know what, you might be right, this could be a bad decision. But the idea is that if you can create your process, understand your rationale and your decision making, and just keep swinging over time, you'll hopefully get a few really big winners that make all the non-winners insignificant. Because if Warren Buffett can publicly admit to his two missteps that he had just over the past year after decades of world-class investing, then we probably shouldn't worry too much about what user 5865 has to say about that stock he bought. Okay, and here's the last takeaway that I had from the Berkshire Annual Letter. Takeaway number four, the show goes on. Now, Warren closes out the letter talking about Omaha, specifically about the world-renowned Berkshire Annual Shareholders Meeting that's coming up in May. Now, I went to it for the first time last year, and I had a great time. But I mentioned before, it's probably not something I'm going to end up doing again, at least not in person, because they stream it online, and I'll probably try to catch it that way. But what was interesting in Warren's letter was that he made a point of emphasizing that he'd be joined on stage by Greg Abel, who runs all the non-insurance operations for Berkshire, as well as Ajit Jain, who runs the insurance operations. Now, they both took the stage last year and in previous years at the meeting, but only for specific parts of the day, with the good majority of the day being Warren and Charlie up there answering questions. But it sounds like now they're going to have all three of them up there the whole time. And I'm assuming that's partly because Charlie won't be there, obviously, but also to start transitioning for life at Berkshire without Warren, which I'm sure they've been doing for a long time inside the company. And Warren even mentions it in the letter as he talks about Greg Abel being, in all respects, ready to be CEO of Berkshire tomorrow. But I think it's just another way to start getting that public perception and confidence in their succession plan out there. Now, one thing Warren always makes clear in his letters and his interviews is his intense love for Omaha. Through much of the letter, he uses his sister Bertie as an example of the quintessential Berkshire shareholder, which is just another great way of how he makes complex topics easier to consume for everyone. But he talks about how there must be something in the water down there where the common sense that kids learn in Omaha is somehow related to making sound investment decisions over time. He compares it to the phenomenons that have helped produce Jamaica's long line of world-class sprinters, Kenya's legendary marathon runners, and Russia's chess experts. Then, probably in the biggest surprise of the whole letter, Warren uses the magic word, AI, wondering if he'll have to wait until AI someday produces the answer of this mysterious puzzle. Now, I thought this was great, because had you asked me beforehand if the word AI would have been in Warren's letter this year, I definitely would have taken the under, but... Even Warren can't resist talking about it. Anyway, it'll be interesting to see if the same amount of people come out to the shareholders meeting or if it starts to dwindle down. In my opinion, it's one of the most interesting events for investors to check out, and I love being able to experience it at least once in person. And hopefully we won't even have to worry about what it'll be like without Warren for a long time. Now, Warren's annual letters are always so good because he does such a good job of explaining these complex topics in an easy to understand way. At least that's why I love them. But you could tell that this one was just a little bit more bittersweet, obviously with the passing of his longtime friend. Now, what did you guys think about the letter this year? Let me know down in the comments below. And if you want to watch the video that I made about Charlie Munger a few months back, click on this right here. Hope you guys have a great day out there. Financial independence is true freedom. So keep building and stacking wins. And I'll see you guys in the next one. Peace.